How's everyone? We have Matt Bomer here. How excited are you? Well, thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon. My guest, Matt Bomer, is an internationally known star who moves comfortably between stage, screen, and television. He has worked on stage at Williamstown Theater Festival, New York Stage and Film, Sundance Theater Lab, and the Alley Theater. On television, he is known for playing the charming criminal Neil Caffrey for six seasons on the hit, yes, USA series White Collar, for which he received the People's Choice Award. For his heart-wrenching performance of New York Times reporter Felix Turner in HBO's The Normal Heart, he received an Emmy nomination and won a Golden Globe Award and Critics' Choice Award. He then became a universally embraced pop culture icon as sizzling stripper Ken in the Magic Mike movies. Magic Mike fans? And for playing Lady Gaga's main squeeze, Donovan, on Ryan Murphy's American Horror Story, Hotel. Other television work includes Traveler, Chuck, Glee, and The Last Tycoon, opposite Kelsey Grammer. He recently made his directorial debut with an episode of American Crime Story Versace. Other films include The Nice Guys, In Time, The Magnificent Seven, and Walking Out. Upcoming films include Vulture Club and Papi Chulo. And now he is making his Broadway debut in the electrifying 50th anniversary production of Mark Crowley's groundbreaking play, The Boys in the Band. Please welcome Matt Bomer. Welcome wow. to Broadway, I know, nice, right? What a nice reception. <laughs> Welcome to Broadway. How does it feel? Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's like a dream I still haven't woken up from, kind of. You know, it's something that I'd always aspired to from, you know, since I can remember as an actor. And so getting to be a part of it, especially with this group and, and this play, has really been a dream come true on, on many, many levels. Yeah. This is your Broadway debut also. Yes, yeah. How magical was that night? <clears throat> I mean, we were all there. I mean, original cast members were there. I mean, what was that night like for you? You mean the, the first preview yeah. or opening night? Well, either. Very actually, different. Because your first, actually your debut would have been that first preview performance yeah. too. Yeah. So what was that first night like? I, I burst into tears at curtain call. <laughs> 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 and it wasn't anything that I, it was completely involuntary actually. Yeah. It wasn't anything that I was manufacturing or I was like, I have to, pro it just, my body took over. Um, it, you know, it, it, I think anytime you're putting a play up in front of an audience and, and you don't know how they're going to respond to certain aspects of the play or certain moments that you've created, you, it's all so surprising. And, and to have the kind of reception we did and to, to just get through it and, and have done it, um, I think was just, overwhelming and I was I was just so grateful and also probably really relieved and um, all the above. How well did you know the play when you got the offer? I didn't know the play at all. Okay. And I knew, you know, a lot of my uh, history of gay theater started with, you know, uh, Torch Song Trilogy and, um, you know, Larry Kramer's plays and sort of, you know, the plays that dealt with the AIDS crisis, you know, yeah. Angels in America. So I didn't know, I, I didn't know a lot about pre-Stonewall life. Um, and so we did a reading and we did a workshop uh, and that was a great chance to kind of dip our toes in the water and see how it felt and also to learn about everything that was going on in 1968 pre-Stonewall and this sort of fervor that was bubbling up in the community that was just about to blow up. Yeah. What was it like getting to know playwright Mark Crowley? I mean, he's wonderful. Yeah. It, it, it's it's a relationship that continues to grow and evolve. Um, I mean, I was just speaking with him yesterday. I just I, I love him. I think it's such a great moment for him, and it seems to have been to enliven him in a great way. And he's just so excited to to finally have his his play be on Broadway after all this time. And. Uh, it's just a wonderful moment to get to share in with him and his collaboration and support have, have always been so intelligent and thoughtful and positive. Because like you said, this is his Broadway debut it's after his writing Broadway this debut. play. It's the play's 50 years old and yeah. it's, it's finally getting a shot on Broadway. 
Let's talk about what kind of insight did he give you? Was there something specifically about Donald or like a favorite story or something he gave you? <clears throat> I think a lot of it he put in the hands of Joe Mantello. Yeah. Um, which is a good person to put your play in the hands of. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it was such an incredible safety net to have Joe at the helm. And, and I think the cutting of the play that he put together yeah. and uh, the guidance and, and the shape and structure that he gave us were just invaluable on, on many, many levels. And I think that Mart was very tasteful and, and sort of letting his notes come through Joe. So we never really had a sense of whether or not it was a, a note from Joe or a note from Mart. Yeah. It was all one holistic endeavor. Well, let's talk about Joe Mantello. Joe Mantello is one of the greatest directors, one of the most yeah. sought after directors. What's it like working with him? First, in the rehearsal room? Well, I think, I, I mean, I think Joe is also one of the greatest actors. Yeah. Uh, on the planet, and, I, and I, I do think he's the best director uh, working on stage today. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw Three Tall Women, but I, I could have gone. Oh, yeah. I saw it twice, and, and I could have gone and seen that every week. I mean, it was just phenomenal. Um, you know, his notes are so good that I would actually write down other people's notes. <laughs> That's how good his notes are. Yeah. They're so insightful yeah. into the human condition. They're yeah. so universal. They're, I was like, ooh, I could use that in my life. <laughs> I have a journal yeah. of everyone else's notes on top of mine. <laughs> I had to like, color code them. Um, you know, he's wonderful. He's a real, he's a real master of the medium. And it's like, it's like working with Soderbergh in film. You know, he lets the sculpture reveal itself. And he, even though he's done an extensive amount of research and thought into the themes and the piece and the world of the play, he's also willing to not know the answers to every question and to find those answers in rehearsal so that the sculpture happens as you're going. It's not something that you know exactly how you want to chip out. It's sort of just happen happening organically as you're going and then all of a sudden it's there. Yeah. No, because you, you put this great <clears throat> company of actors in a room yeah. and you want to see it turn into something. Yeah. And what yeah. you all bring to it. You're, and he's yeah. not heavy handed or yeah. capricious. He's really, he was extraordinarily patient and gracious. And, um, you know, as a director, I, you know, you learn how to talk to actors yourself. Uh, and he just has such a way of, of phrasing notes and giving them to you in a way that makes you feel like you're in ownership of the note as opposed to just some kind of didactic, really extreme, severe, austere, astringent command, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Is that too many adjectives? <laughs> Sorry. I've been reading a lot lately. I play Donald. <laughs> <laughs> But it must also be great because he was an actor and is an actor. Yeah. So he approaches it all from, I, I'm sure that's how he goes into it. I, you know, everyone compares him to Mike Nichols, who yeah. I mean, obviously I would have dreamed of working with him. And um, to me, I think he's, he's like a, a mix of like Mike Nichols and Kazan. Yeah. Because he also knows how to get into your psychology and to, to, you know, take an actor aside and whisper a little something to them and then take another. You know, it's all one really big psychological morass that then comes to play on stage. Yeah. yeah. I love the character of Donald. <clears throat> how many of you have seen The Boys in the Band already? Oh my gosh, thank you. The rest of you need to come immediately. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Free ticket to the door when you leave. When you leave, Mama. <laughs> That's your going away prize today. Um, I love the role of Donald because Donald is also an observer. Yeah. So when you were working on him, what's, what was it like? Like, how did you get into Donald? Well, it's an, you know, this play presents a lot of um, incredible uh, opportunistic challenges for an actor yeah. because there are no scene breaks, especially for Donald and Michael. You're on stage the entire play. Um, so I think there are maybe 10 seconds without me at the top and then 10 seconds without Michael at the end. Um, so, so much of it is about knowing what your relationships are to the other characters and what happened the last time you saw each other and, and who they are to you now and who they become to you over the evening and um, letting that play out over the course of an hour and 45 minutes on stage every night and not locking into anything too severely. And, um, but I think, you know, obviously I had to work on somebody who 
a lot of it is he, he was symptomatic of the times. He was somebody who was able-bodied by, by every stretch of the imagination. He should be a success on paper, yet he perceives himself as a failure because of how society views homosexuals, how his, what his analyst is telling him, uh, what he's experiencing with his family. And so here he is, this perfectly capable, able person who's now dropped out of Cornell, left his job, sequestered himself off, into, off to the Hamptons where he's cleaning houses for his father. And yet here he is at this party because he'll take the love and affection anywhere he can get it, no matter how toxic and, and, and uh, dangerous it might be. Um, but it's a, it's a great role because I really do get to watch and experience everyone's performance every night and, and it's never the same every night and, and some people, you know, see him as a real enigma and then some people see him as, as someone who they watch the play through his eyes. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of the artists that I, I, I've loved and respected over the years have, have really uh, thankfully um, gotten what, what Joe and I were trying to do with the character, which is to try to kind of witness a little bit of the party through this guy who shouldn't be there by all intent, for all intents and purposes. He should be off working in, at a great job and be a success in life, and circumstantially he can't be, and yet he's also still so loyal to Michael, and sort of as everything's falling apart, he's really the only one who's there for him through thick and thin. Yeah. Because we've seen the show a few times. Um, my husband and I, I love to watch, you have two. I love to watch it through your eyes because Donald takes all this stuff in. It's like he's watching everybody, live, watching how other people live their lives yeah. and everything else. I think that's what he's trying to do is find a way to live. Yeah. You know, and this room is filled with so many different um, archetypes within yeah. the community. and and. It's like, oh, is the, uh, this couple is still bickering and having trouble with, with you know, the fidelity and, and, and how, how to do that, monogamy. So how, what's that about? And then what's it like to be Michael who just sort of plows his way through life? And then what's it like to be Harold who owns his authenticity but is also still pretty caustic? And then what's it like to be <laughs> Bernard? And, uh, uh, you know, this play uh, opened a couple weeks after MLK was assassinated. And then you have this African-American character who's finding his own voice and his own struggle and 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 uh, Emery Robbins character who's who's you know so authentic and and but still also having to deal with all that that brings you in terms of the cost and to society and then you have Alan who for all intents and purposes from based on the analysis Donald's going through it ha has won he's won the game he's married he has kids he's a lawyer he has a great job and he's just as miserable as everybody else yeah. and he's staying there and why is he staying there so yeah. there's a lot for him to wrap his head around over the course of the evening yeah you know this 50th anniversary production is flawless in every way the cast is the perfect ensemble and you are all working at the top of your game all that for twenty dollars <laughs> 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 can you believe it what is it like sharing the stage with you all know who's i mean zachary tell the people who are in you're sharing the stage with i mean this well, cast. Za zachary quinto yeah. who i've known whom i've known for 22 years okay. and we went to college together at carnegie mellon yeah. Uh, Jim Parsons, yeah. who I've known for years, who's phenomenal. They're all phenomenal. Yeah. I'll just preface yeah. uh, by yeah. saying that. Um, uh, Michael Benjamin Washington, who I've known since 2001. Wow. Andrew Reynolds, I've yeah. known since 2003. Brian Hutchison, uh, Robin DeJesus. Um, who am I forgetting? Andrew I said Andrew Reynolds, yeah. 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 Tuck Watkins, who's phenomenal yeah. and incredible as Hank. Um, did I get everybody? Yeah. Yeah, they're all, who? Oh, Oh, and Charlie Carver, Charlie who's phenomenal Carver. as the cowboy. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, thank you for your assistance. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I have to go through the play sequentially to get through everybody. Find everybody. Um, but uh, no, it's, it, it's an incredible group. And normally, I've always been, you know, typically the only out gay actor on any, at any workplace I've been in. So to get to share the stage with these other guys who have had so many similar experiences, and we have such a great shorthand together, and... But more importantly than anybody's identity, everybody's just there for the right reasons to really explore the story and, and, and tell it as truthfully as possible every night and to, and to dig in and, and just do the best work we can. And it's, you know, it's, it's a unique experience to have a show where you're all on stage basically the whole time because it's such a, talk about a trust fall. I mean, you are, have to be there for each other every moment of the show. You are one integrated being. And if you, somebody drops the ball, somebody else has to pick it up. And, um, so it's just, it's been uh, a really, really um, unforgettable experience. 
And the audience is electrifying when you, right, when you sit in the booth theater before it even starts. Mm, I mean, yeah. you must hear that just like, You know, every audience <laughs> is so different. Yeah. Truly, sometimes I think, oh my gosh, that's the most mordant audience we've had so far. <laughs> but then they're the first to rise yeah. to their feet and they're still yeah. clapping by the time the lights, house lights go up. So you can't really base it on yeah. what people are laughing at yeah. or responding to because a lot of the material is really shocking and new to some people. So they don't know how to respond. And sometimes they respond by <laughs> laughing to relieve pressure. And sometimes they're just quiet and taking it back. And then sometimes they are leaned back in their chair going, what you got? <laughs> and for them, they get option A. <laughs> Kidding. I want to go back to the beginning. Growing up, where did your love for performing begin? And what were your earliest creative outlets? Um, well, I was, an, I was an outside kid with yep. a really wild imagination. Uh, and I lived uh, from zero to nine. I lived in uh, the greater St. Louis area in this neighborhood that at the time, I, I didn't know this, it had been written up by Time Magazine as one of the, one of the best places to raise children. Because there was a creek next to me and a sled hill and no fences and you just run around with your dogs and I could just be in my own little imaginary world all day long. Um, I didn't really know how to give voice to that in any kind of public forum until I was in sixth grade. You're allowed to take an elective at a, a credit due to uh, in a Texas public school. Uh, they had a theater arts elective, and I had this wonderful woman, Marla Crow, who saw my active imagination and, and gave voice to all these characters I created in my head and taught me acting through improvisation. I mean, it wasn't like Viola Spolin or anything. It was like, <laughs> you're both trapped in an elevator, go! Uh, it was very kind of, it was very kind of Groundlings-esque. Um, but I loved it, I loved it, I loved it. And um, so she kind of got me into forensics, yeah. and I started doing well with that, and then, um, and then I started doing plays in high school. I didn't do the forensics as much in high school because I wanted to kind of, I knew I was maybe gonna get to go to conservatory and so I didn't want to have that life in high school. Yeah. I wanted to live a little bit more and so uh, outside of just those parameters. And so I played sports and did student council and did other things, but um, I would do the plays. And we had this incredible um, teacher at the time who was only around for my freshman year, but he had us doing scenes from Angels in America and, and The Destiny of Me and Torch Song Trilogy and, and I mean, all these incredible, lips together, teeth apart, like, really? all these incredible plays when I was like 14. <laughs> I was like, I gotta go to my church youth group tonight, but first I gotta get my Destiny of Me rehearsal in. <laughs> and it was like, it was a really weird, I mean, for, for public consumption, we were doing, you know, Hamlet and yeah. the Little Foxes, but behind closed doors, yeah. we were doing the toast of Off-Broadway. It was like Lonely Planet and, yeah. you know, all this kind of, but it was, so it was, it exposed me to a lot of really amazing work really early on. Was this the Klein High School? Uh, yeah, Klein High School. And did you go with Lee Pace? I did, yeah. Okay, I so did many, many uh, productions yeah. with Lee Pace in high school. Because yeah. Lee Pace was here a few weeks ago. No way! Oh, yeah. I Pace. love him. Yeah, we do too. We're I, supposed to have see each other tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I've tried to see him every week since I've been here because what are the odds that we'll both be on Broadway and, Isn't that crazy? and, and sort of seminal gay plays at the same time? <laughs> but they've got a high school together. Yeah. 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 So do you do plays together in high school? Yeah, many. All right. We did The Diary of Anne Frank. We did Wild Honey, which is a, a yeah. Michael Frayn adaptation of Platonov, which is one of the Chekhov five actors. We did, uh, what else did we do? Oliver, we did South Pacific, we did Crazy For You. Also, oh, there's musicals the in there. The whole work! <laughs> <laughs> so, but did your- Gershwin, Rodgers and Hammerstein, <laughs> everything. We're getting you to Broadway in a musical. It's gonna happen. Let's do it. Let's do it. Talk about the Alley Theater. That was life-changing mm -hmm. for you, wasn't it? It was. Um, one of the contacts that this teacher had made before he left um, was this woman named Annalie Jeffries, who was in the rep company at the Alley. And it, it, to this day, is one of the most phenomenal actors I've ever witnessed on stage. And she was playing uh, Blanche in Streetcar Named Desire. And before that, she was teaching an Ann Bogart workshop on viewpoints and ensemble. So that was really my introduction to like a first proper acting class was through Ann Bogart's, who, I, I don't know if you know who Ann Bogart is, but she sure. basically, she, I, she, is she still at Columbia? I think, she, I think she's on faculty at Columbia yeah. Grad School, but she teaches acting through ensemble and how to be a part of a whole on stage and these things called viewpoints. And 
So everything was about a team effort. And uh, so I did that with her, and then she got me an audition, and I got, uh, I was cast in A Streetcar Named Desire with her at the alley that Michael Wilson directed. You played the Young Collector, right? I was the understudy for the Young Collector. They had, a University of Houston grad program had like a feed-in program yeah. for casting at the alley. Um, so it was like a, like a 30-year-old guy played the Young Collector, and I was, <laughs> I, who was actually 17, was the understudy, but he was phenomenal on getting to watch him work every night. And, and then Michael had a, a New Orleans ensemble. So we would do, in the interstitials, the scene, yeah. we would do little bits of like, you know, um, the Lady of Larkspur Lotion or one of his uh, short plays in between that just that created part of that New Orleans uh, life while there was a mezzanine scene and while they were changing the scenery around. Yeah. So you do Tennessee Williams from a very early age. He was the first professional playwright I worked on. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You trained at Carnegie That's Mellon. Thing to say. He was the first yeah. playwright I got to work on professionally. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm already like Donald. I'm correcting my own grammar. <laughs> Fabulous. You trained at Carnegie Mellon. Was yeah. your Magic Mike co-star, Joe? He was Maganello, in my class. Was he in your class? Yeah. So yeah. what was that like? Great. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. Uh, no, he, uh, we, uh, you know, it's a very small class, and yeah. they, they, back then they had a really stringent cut program. So, you know, you, you, we started out with 20, and I think we ended up with a nine. So these Holy people were like your family, you know. I mean, you knew each other inside and out, yeah. and you'd seen each other fail phenomenally on stage and succeed phenomenally on stage and have their greatest triumphs and their worst disasters. So I can't imagine anybody who I would have felt better being in a Speedo on stage with than, <laughs> than him, <laughs> because he'd seen me at my best and my worst. What did you take away from those years at Carnegie Mellon? Because it was very cutthroat, like you said. You, you, you wheedled down to, to the real business, right? Yeah, I think you found out really fast if you were cut out for the business yeah. because you were working. I mean, uh, my sophomore year, I'd be doing a scene from Moliere, uh, a scene from Shaw, a Pinter scene, wow. a Shakespearean monologue, and building sets for the seniors while doing another play, you know, the Scottish play in class. So you're really, I mean, you're just soaking it all in, and you're getting to work on the best plays and the best roles, that roles that you may never get to work on again. And this safe nest with a faculty that's there to support you and help you challenge yourself in the right way and, and find ultimately where you need, what your entry point into the business should be. Yeah. So when you came to New York, you started working in soap operas, didn't you? I started in theater, yeah. actually. And um, I, was ca I did the first uh, workshop of Spring Awakening. And then from that, I... Got an, uh, well, I was first cast in Thoroughly Modern Millie. Uh, uh, Sutton Foster and I were the understudies at La Jolla. And I, it was like right when I was getting to New York and I, wanted to, I needed to find a place to live. And my roommate was like, wait, you're going to go to La Jolla? For... So I had, to, I had to pass on that job so I could kind of get my feet under me here in New York. But uh, because of Spring Awakening, Michael let me audition for it again when Sutton had become Sutton. Sutton. <laughs> and uh, I, I, was, I was Gavin Creel and Mark Kudish's cover on that. I love that. But we were waiting, 9-11 uh, happened, and yep. we were waiting for months and months and months to get a house, and I had to pay my bills because yeah. I lost my day job because no one was coming to New York at the time. And uh, so I did a soap for a year. The Guiding Light? The Guiding, the guiding Light. Okay. <laughs> Crazy character, right? Yeah, I mean, I told the writers early on, I don't know what gave me the gall or wherewithal to feel like I could tell the writers anything at the time. I wasn't telling them what I wanted to be. I was just like, I want a soap opera. I was like, I want the craziest storyline you've ever given anybody. I'm not going to be here for a long time, so just have at it. Give me something crazy. And they obliged. <laughs> So he was a serial killer, wasn't he, Ben Reed? Well, you're jumping to the oh, end. Okay, I mean, that's okay, not... okay, all right, okay. So much for Rewind. bearing the you lead. Didn't, you didn't hear that. Uh, no. <laughs> I, do you want me to go through the whole thing? I've done this ad nauseum, and I'm so sorry because I'm sure half of you may or may not have heard it before, but I was a trust fund baby who, who, who bet that my, my fraternity brothers that I could be the first to deflower the town virgin, who was, of course, the daughter of the big matriarch of the soap, the big grand diva, Riva. You know Riva. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, then, of course, I fell in love with her, and she found out about the bet. She dumped me. Then I had a new girlfriend, and I lost my trust fund. I was scared to tell her, so I turned to, you know, what any logical person would do. I became a male prostitute. <laughs> All my clients were cougars. 
<laughs> so I was like 22, that's such a derogatory thing to say. All my clients were, were women over a certain, you know, and I was like 22. Uh, so I'd be doing these scenes with him at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning that were pretty, you know, lascivious. Um, and uh, then I went crazy. Oh, she found out that I was a prostitute, dumped me. I went crazy and kidnapped her to a remote cabin in the woods, confessed to her that I'd been uh, molested by my female school teacher as a child because it was in the news at the time. It was very topical. And uh, by the way, now that woman's married to that guy, I think. Anyway, I digress. I, and then I, I killed myself uh, by injecting myself with a syringe full of insulin. Uh, and then hang, I hung on one extra day in the hospital to confess all my sins before I died. But my favorite part of that whole experience is that as I'm walking out in my death makeup and like pulling the IV out of my arm and going back to my dressing room, the writers came up to me and said, if you ever want to come back. <laughs> We've got it all figured out. I was like, I just flatlined. How? So who the knows? The soap world. Had the soap world continued, maybe I'd be an evil twin right now. Who knows? <laughs> or I guess a good twin. What did you take away from those soap years? Oh my gosh, it was the best yeah. training ever. Because I was, I, was, I was terrified of cameras at the time. Because all I'd done was theater yeah. for... At that point, I think I'd already been doing theater for 10 years, or not 10 years, maybe. Yeah, I would say yeah. including middle school, 10 years. And so I you know, didn't know what it was like and what all these three different cameras at once, and when the red light was on, that's when you respond, and all these things. And, and by the end, I was just, you know, at, at the beginning, I was shaking. Um, and by the end, they would say, OK, um, we're not going to have time to block this. We need you to cry out of your downstage eye on camera two on <laughs> this part of the monologue when we cut to you, if we can, OK? And five, four, three. <laughs> and you'd have to do it. And wow. so it was at that point, I was like, oh, OK. I, can, I, can, I figured out a little bit of how to do what I've been doing on stage for a while in front of a camera in a more intimate way. Because I've asked every actor here, when they start on stage and they go to like TV or film, what those first few days are like. Terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Terrifying. They're like, less, less. Like, you know, yeah. turn that way. The camera's there. I mean, my <laughs> God. I, I, don't, I don't even think they knew what to say to me. I was like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> what do you say to that? Yeah, totally. Stop freaking out. <laughs> well, you did. Yeah. Your debut in Hollywood was the action thriller. Was it Flight Plan? That was the first uh, studio movie I did, yeah. yeah. With Jodie yeah. Foster. Yeah. Favorite memories of that? What do you remember being on that set and working on that? Well, oh, well, it was, it was great because that, again, was kind of, a, um, it, it felt a little bit like an ensemble because we were all on an airplane together. So you all had to be there pretty much every day of the shoot because the director didn't know when he was going to see any part of the plane or whoever was on the plane. And so I would say, and also the director, in exchange for me um, playing this sort of, um, I'll use the word again, lascivious flight attendant, uh, who is sort of kind of devil may care. She, he let me sit in all, on all the rehearsals with Jodie Foster. So I got to watch um, she and all the other amazing actors, Sean Bean, um, Peter, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? Peter Sarsgaard, all these people just do their work on these scenes and carve them out and see how she composed herself and how professional she was and how courteous she was to the crew. and how gracious she was, and she would give me little nuggets of wisdom every now and then. And uh, so I think that's what made that one worthwhile for me. Isn't it great when you work on something early on with those kind of people yeah. who will look out for you that way? Yeah, yeah. And I remember her encouraging me. She was like, when you're, you know, because so many actors who'd come out of conservatory would be very picky if they were getting role. She was like, take any job that comes your way and just do the best work you can. And that's, I took that to heart. I like that. You played recurring rogue CIA agent Bryce Larkin on NBC's comedy drama Chuck. Chuck fans? Yes. All right, cool. Zachary uh, Levi was there at opening night. Uh, totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. How much fun was doing Chuck? Chuck was a blast. It came out of the blue. I had done a show with Viola Davis and Logan Marshall Green called Traveler yeah. on ABC, um, which was kind of short-lived, sadly. 
Um, and Viola had bigger and better things to do. <laughs> <laughs> we were lucky to have her for eight episodes. Uh, but uh, so we, uh, I had just come off that, and, and they, it was the same uh, studio, so yeah. they were like, you should, it was a tough casting uh, job because in the, in the pilot was mostly action. It was like parkour and Krav Maga and all these wild things. And um, so I sat down with the creatives and we had a meeting and then, and then for whatever reason they hired me. But I just had the best time. There was this director called McGee who directed it. I don't know if you know any of us. We did Charlie's Angels. And, but he has this amazing enthusiasm and infectious energy that just makes you believe you can do anything. Like, swing off that and then fly through that window and then land over there. And you're like, yeah! <laughs> and then as they're calling action, you're like, what the f did I just say I would do? Um, but yeah, so it was a blast. And that cast was great. And Zachary Levi was just so, has he been here with you? You should have him. I, he's no, so I had wonderful. Him when she loves me. Yes, yeah. I had okay, them. great. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's hilarious because he's a great dramatic actor, but yeah. he's an incredible comedian and, and singer. And he, he sets a really yeah. great oh, yeah. tone on set. Uh, and, and so I kind of watched him and got to learn how to be a really, uh, hopefully, magnanimous, inclusive yeah. person who's higher up on the call sheet and, 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 and make sure that it felt like an ensemble. He just, he just he set a lot of really great examples for yeah. me. Sort of captain the ship. Yeah. On a project. Yeah, but also do it in a way that doesn't make it feel like you're captaining yeah. the ship. Because I've, I've also been on sets where there's definitely a captain of the ship. <laughs> and they maybe shouldn't be the captain of the ship. They're the captain of the Titanic. <laughs> totally. So, rest in peace, sorry. Um, it was tasteless. Tasteless, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, no, and so it, just a way to make it feel, again, like going back to the Ann Bogart thing, like an ensemble, like, like a group effort. Yeah. Well. You are known to millions of fans around the world for your breakout role of Neil Caffrey on the hit USA series White Collar, White Collar fans, which ran for six seasons. Yeah. You must have so many incredible memories. What are some I of your do. favorites? That group of people, uh, it was just the most wonderful cast and there was, no one was ever late, no one ever yep. stormed off set. There were never any arguments. It was always a best idea win scenario. Every day was fun and exciting and joyful, and we really were a family. And 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 the th you know what we got to do on that show was just so fun. It was so fun. It never took itself too seriously, but it did have heavier dramatic moments, and it also had really light moments, and a lot of great stunt work we got to do, and. Um, and then at the end, you know, it was nice to have, I got to have a little bit of a hand in how things would wrap up on the show. And that's, that's one of the, the proudest things I, I, I got to be a part of on that show because I feel like people um, have, I don't know how you feel or not, but a lot of the response I get from people on the street is that they were happy with how the show yeah. wound down and that it left room for more, but also closed a lot of doors, but also opened some. And so that was an important to me. And, and I'm really grateful to, to our creator and USA Network that I got to weigh in there. Yeah. You know, we all know that you can sing, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> But you got to sing with Diane Carroll on the show. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. so many great memories. You know, when you're doing it <clears throat> 70 hours a week, six months out of the year for six years, it's hard to just single in on one memory. It still feels so experiential to me, and I'm sure at some point I'll, I'll get really nostalgic and sit down and watch it episode by episode, and so many things are going to come flooding back to me, but I'm not ready to cry that hard just yet. <laughs> so. How big of a pinch me moment was that? That was such a beautiful segment of you singing with her from the Great American Songbook. Oh, uh, it was completely surreal. I, uh, one of the things that they did such a good job of on that show was kind of learning uh, different aspects about us as actors and, and what we could do and, and things that might be fun that we were doing, you know, backstage or off camera that we thought, oh, put that on camera, you know? And they would hear me singing down the hallways. So they thought, sing with Diane Carroll. When are you going to get this chance again? And so, and we got to go into a recording booth yeah. and sing it. It's just, it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Well, you won. I love her. I still oh, stay she's in the touch best. with her. Yeah. yeah. I'd love yeah. to get her here, too. I think oh, what a career that woman's had. You would have yeah. such a good time. Yeah. Get a little martini right here. <laughs> we can do Let that. Let her we sit can. back and tell you some stories. Okay. <laughs> you won numerous awards, including the Golden Globe <clears throat> and the Critics' Choice Award for your heart-wrenching performance of closeted New York Times writer Felix Turner in HBO's film of Larry Kramer's groundbreaking play, Masterpiece, The Normal Heart. Yeah. Normal Heart fans here. That, 
was such an incredible thing to watch on television, to watch mm -hmm. your transformation, to watch what you did with that. The cast, of the ensemble cast you worked with, of mm -hmm. course, led by Mark Ruffalo and you and everybody else. Mm -hmm. What are your fondest memories of that? That was a personal thing you really wanted to do, mm -hmm. didn't you? Because you yeah. read those plays Oh my on. gosh, yeah, I mean, play. yeah. I, I, I feel like I owed my life to Larry Kramer and, yeah. and was willing to get close to sacrificing it for him. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and, and just coming of age and, and starting to work professionally in the theater, you know, Pre AZT and all that was so I you know a lot of my early experiences had been surrounded by that plague and so I felt a, such an onus and a, and a responsibility to to commit to that with every fiber of my being you know uh, not not in a not in a sensational look yeah. at me way but in a in a really just in service to the material way um, which you try to do with every role but this had a lot of deeper meaning um, for me on, on many levels, but uh, it's hard, it, it was such an experiential thing. I think um, I love that Mark was just so game as an actor and brought so much, I mean his Larry Kramer is pretty phenomenal. <laughs> it's like kind of uncanny, um, but just getting to work with him and we would, we really stayed in character in between scenes and how we related to each other and we would just have little conversations about our life or what was going on in character between scenes so that it, because you have such little time together on a movie, you have to really just jump in and, and we wanted it to feel lived in and real. And so it was just, it was just kind of a magical time. I mean, I think the real win is to get to do that show eight times a week, you know, um, but to get to put it on film and to have Ryan and, and HBO be so collaborative and letting them shut down for me to lose 40 pounds and do all that stuff was just, you know, I don't think we could have done it anywhere else. Because when I first signed on, it was a movie. Yeah. It was a movie, and I remember getting the phone call from Ryan about a year, maybe a year, year and a half before we started that it was gonna be at HBO, and I thought, oh, thank God, because they'll market it. They'll know how to get this out there, and more eyes will get to see this story. Then, you know, you never know with a movie. It could just, the wrong distributor could get it, and then it could just come and go. Sure. You know? Well, let's talk about Ryan Murphy. You brought him up. You live in his world. You've done a lot yeah. of stuff for him. Glee, American Horror Story, American Crime Story, and of new course- New Normal. The, what's that? The New Normal. The New Normal, exactly, right, yeah. What's it like working with him? Because mm. he's also one of the co-producers, of course, of The Boys in the Band. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's wonderful. I, he, he just brought, you know, uh, with Jessica, bring, brought her back to stage in yeah. Long Day's Journey Tonight yeah. last year, and now this, and he's really getting his hand in, in, the, in the theater world as well, which I love. He's so uh, magnanimous and generous of spirit, and he, and he really has created this repertory company of actors who he's so loyal to. And uh, you know that again, that was my first experience of working at the Alley. They have a repertory company there, as I'm sure you all know. But so uh, my first experience is, oh, you're just a family, and you get to do all these great plays together. And then you get out into the world and realize you may never see these people again after you finish a job. And he really has just uh, created this family. And he's one of those people who I just in implicitly trust. And oftentimes he sees things in me that I don't even see in myself or I'm not self-aware enough to notice in myself. And he, he'll bring them out in me. Yeah, because he let you direct American Crime yeah. Story, Versace. How did that call come to you? I mean, how did that happen? He knew that I was very studious and did a lot of homework and enjoyed doing homework and would come to set with binders and dog-eared pages and different colored highlighters and all those things. And he said, <laughs> he said to me, you should direct. And I, you know, took it with a grain of salt. We were, we were working together at the time. I, I was an actor at the time. and. Uh, working with him, and he called me out of the blue in December of, gosh, I guess it was December of 17, and uh, said, I want you to direct, and I thought, oh, well, um, what's it going to be? And he said, I want you to do an hour of Versace, and I, you know, soiled myself, and then <laughs> shot it out with glee. Um, <clears throat> No, it was a really, it's a, I mean, that's a really tall, steep first yeah. assignment as a director. And so I just immersed myself in the world of directing for five months and studying and studying different directors and source material and reading books. And uh, then I shadowed a couple of the directors in the show who were gracious enough to have me. I did an intensive at the DGA. I mean, I really... Yeah did everything I could to be prepared. And it, and it paid off because when I got to set, I was so over-prepared that I could actually really enjoy myself 
while I was doing it. Because he's the kind of producer, director who takes talent and puts you on that highest diving board, right? Yeah. And says, here yeah. you are, go do your yeah. thing. And you do it. Yeah. And you do it so well. That was a gorgeous episode. That was a gorgeous series. Thank but you. You, for everybody who saw it, Thank you. The series really, really good. What did you yeah. enjoy the most? What was the most challenging aspect of it? Of directing? Yeah. Uh, I think the t most challenging thing in episodic in particular, and probably anything that has a budget uh, of you know, any reasonable proportions, is time. Yeah. Yeah. And I had, I had a lot of really specific challenges for any director, much less a first-time director. I had children actors. I had um, different time periods. Uh, I had five different cities in three different countries, all that I had to shoot in LA. Uh, so, you know, there were a lot of specific challenges, um, but the, the, then you get to hopefully rise to meet them, and, and then you check that off the list and go, oh, okay, I've done that. Uh, this is gonna be okay. I had John John Briones, who Ryan was gracious enough to step on a limb with me and cast him. Um, because John Dunn was obviously a phenomenal, huge theater star, yep. but hadn't done a lot of uh, TV and film. And again, Ryan gave him that high dive, and he just knocked it out of the park. Um, so getting to work with him and witness that was really phenomenal as well. And Darren, who I've uh, known for years, and getting to see him, not just in the episode I directed, but the two that I shadowed was just, I mean, what an extraordinary performance and well-deserved Emmy nomination today yep. he got. Um, yep. As did, as did most of the cast yeah. and, and the show itself. Um, but uh, he, he, there were times, and he, and he was very, he, he didn't, uh, he wasn't somber or, or malicious the whole time he was on set. He was, he was very carefree in between takes, and then all of a sudden he would just zone in. And there were times when they'd be framing up on him, and I'd look at the monitor, and the light would hit him in a way that was just freaky, because he looked like Andrew Kananen. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so just getting to see that great work and, and getting to play with actors. I love actors. Yeah. I love actors. I've always loved actors. I've always admired them. I always put them on a pedestal. I think it's so courageous and brave what they do. I've, even the thorny actors I love. Um, <laughs> truly, and I've worked with some thorny ones, yeah. and I love them. I love them. I love them. I love what they bring to the table. I mean, unless it's just this thing where it's just all in service to ego, which you yeah. don't really see a lot of anymore because, frankly, there's just... Too many jobs for people who aren't about that, you know, thank God. And like I said, there's no time. There's no time. There's not anymore. Yeah. No, not anymore. Would you like to direct more? Yeah, I plan to. I have a few offers for the fall, and, and depending on scheduling, uh, I, I know at least one of them is going to work out, and I'll be doing something for Ryan in the fall. Great. Yeah. American Horror Story Hotel. Fans? <laughs> really? We're all obsessed with that show. Oh, and, wow. and that season, really? too. Oh, all those oh, seasons. Wow. Okay. Hotel, working with Lady Gaga. You Got have to tell sick us. sick puppies up in here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I did the blood orgy, okay? I'm with you. Um, Lady Gaga. Yeah. What a great actress. Oh, my gosh. What a phenomenal yeah. artist. Just fearless. Yeah. Fearless. She's fire. She's just a red, you know. She came in on day one. I sound like an old like theater actor. She's a red. <laughs> oh, what a red. Um, she uh, she came in though on day one, and it was a tall order, you know. To to she, and she had to carry a scene in front of most of the ensemble, yeah. all of whom were very seasoned actors, uh, in, not including myself, but you know, like Kathy Bates and yeah. you know Sarah Paulson, people like that. And, she just nailed it and got it and, and was game for anything and, and truly, I mean, would take a take to places on one take that was completely different from the take before and just took so much courage and bravura to do it. Um, she, I mean, I guess when you perform in front of stadiums of yeah. hundreds of thousands of people, you're like, yeah, I can do a take on American Horror Story. <laughs> <laughs> but I love her, and she was so supportive and great and, and really good at, you know, sort of demystifying herself in a way that made her approachable as an actor. Um, I remember she had, we kind of had this method acting dinner where she invited Finn and I over to her home yeah. very graciously, and we had steak cooked rare and she was kind of dressed as the countess and she was really trying on the skin of the character and I was like, oh, I can roll with this. <laughs> Where is this night gonna take me? And we just had the best time and the best creative conversation and it completely broke the ice, you know? Yeah. And from there on out, I was like, oh, this is, 
an artist who I can just collaborate with and throw ideas at. And so it was, it was wonderful. Do you have a lot of rehearsals for those episodics or no? It depends on the show. You know, for the first three years of White Collar, yeah. we would get our lines the morning of. And I had a lot to say yeah. <laughs> and do. We'd have a general idea of what it was, but then there would be like a final draft that came in. And um, thankfully, around season four, they started to fix it a little bit. But um, so that was, you know, thank God I had done a soap, you know, um, because I was like, oh, okay, one take and not a lot of rehearsal. Oh, the material I just got, okay, I've done this before. Um, so yeah, uh, and then there, there are jobs I've done where you get a, a much longer period of rehearsal. Like when you work with Soderbergh, like you really hash things out in rehearsal. Like you better bring your A game at rehearsal. You better not be half-assed or just be kind of marking it. Like, oh, I'll find it in the scene. Like, because you won't be in the movie. Because um, he's watching and editing as you're doing rehearsal. So you really get everything locked in, and then you come in, you do one or two takes, and you're done. That's it. Because so many directors are different, so you sort many of have to of the know takes when you and, go and in. Magic Mike are one take. Interesting, yeah. really. One take. Quick, quick shoot. We can get like, Magic like Mike a, fans. Let's talk about Magic Mike. Oh. We'll get into that. Sorry, I did not intend to bring that up. <laughs> the job that will never escape me. <laughs> but you know what's interesting about those movies? They are so mm. popular around the world in so many different languages. Yeah. <laughs> Is that bad? <laughs> Stripping knows no language. <laughs> Did we bore you? <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> God, you're good, Ian. Uh, <laughs> they were like, oh, they're talking about the stripper movie. Let's get out of here now. They um, won't be in a stripper movie, so we're done. Um, I, you know, when I... <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's the theater. It's the theater it's a, exactly. person in me. Um, I uh, when we were asked to do that, it was a very it was like a five million dollar independent film. Yeah. So I thought it was going to be you know the girlfriend experience or one of Soderbergh's you know smaller more experimental indie films. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew it had some starry splashy names in it. And Channing was really a star on the rise at the time. And Matthew was just right in the middle of the reconnaissance. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And uh, he, <laughs> so, but we got there, and I, I remember we were doing all the strip club scenes, and all of a sudden these suits started showing up at the monitor, and it was only the third or fourth film I'd done, so I was really green. I didn't know what was going on, and I remember saying to Channing at the time, what, what, who are all these people? Why are they here? Because it'd been, you know, Stephen's sets are so closed off. They're so private. I mean, there's no bureaucracy there at all. And uh, they were like, oh, uh, there's a bidding war between studios for the movie. And I was like, well, if I'd known that many people were going to see me strip, I might not have done this. <laughs> but um, I'm glad I did, truly. And, and, and then it became a summer tentpole movie, yeah. and it was just that time in society when we were ready to stop casting so many aspersions on people whose professions were, you know, traditionally seen as sort of shadowy or whatever it might be. We were ready to sort of take the veil off that and celebrate it and enjoy it and sort of turn, turn on the female gaze a little bit towards the men, yeah. which I was really glad we got to be a part of. I actually find Magic Mike XXL to be kind of a feminist movie in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> Some people tell me. I don't know. Am I wrong? Am I giving it too much credit? I don't no. know. <laughs> I have to ask you about auditioning because we have an audience full of actors and many at home watching who say, you know, I have talent, but I'm not really good at auditioning. Uh, I don't know what's uh, going to happen behind yeah. that door. Are you a good auditioner? <clears throat> Were you always a good auditioner? And what's the secret to good auditioning? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Big questions here. Um, yeah. I wish the audition process were like it used to be back in the 70s, because then I'd just say, read Michael Shurtleff's book, which I'm yep. sure many of you have read before. If you haven't, it's still definitely worth reading. There is a, a great new book on auditioning by the woman who cast The Last Tycoon. I, I came on project, the project before she did, but I, I, she, you should IMDb her, because it's a really good book, and she's a really great casting director. Um, but it's more modern audition techniques. I was kind of a streaky auditioner. Sometimes I would 
you just you know be able to go in guns blazing and then sometimes I would clam up and a lot of it depended on the room and the temperature of the room and and I, I am kind of an intuitive person so I could feel almost immediately like how I was being perceived in the room before I'd even spoken a line and sometimes I would let that get in my head and I think it's really about <clears throat> owning that space and making the audition yours and a chance for you to further your craft and commit to something and not worry about whether it's safe or whether they like it or whether it fits their, you know, there are so many people you have to stand out from in this day and age. And so you really want to um, get in there and just, you know, give it your all and, and make it something that you can walk away from saying, I I owned that in the way I wanted to own it. Well, even if it was just being able to endow a casting director who's reading like, you know, somnambulistically, you know, as you're trying to commit to a scene with them, um, you know, it, 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 learning how to just really be present in one of those rooms. I think that's whatever you can take in it that's going to further you as an actor, further your craft as an actor, I think is always a good thing. And then just having people on your team. I had to test for white collar twice because they wanted someone who was in their 40s and British, like a Remington Steel kind yeah. of thing, and which I get, you know. Uh, and so I had to completely change the minds of every executive. And I was just lucky that I had this casting director and, and the creator who really believed in me and, and were like, you're our guy, so here's what they want. And, they, and I would work with him on the side. I'd call him on the phone and go, okay, so what are they looking for in the room? <laughs> and we would sort of hash it out together and work through it, and then we were able to sort of change everybody's minds. So sometimes it's just getting lucky and finding somebody who's willing to, to walk you through the process. You know? Beautiful advice. Really nice. Because that's a scary door. No one knows. And all those voices creep into actors' Sharon heads. Sharon Bialy. Okay. Sharon Bialy. B-I-A-L-Y is the casting director who has the new book on auditioning. Well, let's talk about The Last Tycoon. Great series. Thank you. Great actors. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. St streaming now, you can watch it. What did you love the most about living in that time period and that role? Uh, well, I've always been a huge fan of Fitzgerald, yeah. so I, who is not easy to interpret for the camera, as many things will attest to. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 it was just a beautiful... I mean, talk about a dream behind the scenes team. Um, Patrizia von Brandstein did the sets, who did Amadeus, um, that was the creative team behind Mad Men, uh, the same hair and makeup and costume department, <laughs> Janie Bryant, who did such incredible work with the Mad Men, also, uh, I thought, had some phenomenal costume work on that show. Um, and getting to play with a great group of actors, you know, and, and um, it, it's funny, we poured our heart and souls into that and, and, and worked so hard on it. And, and I get the most, it, it wasn't something that made like a big pop culture splash, but I'll get the most phenomenal, tasteful people who will approach me in public. I was at Bar Central the other night with some high flutin' people just kind of, believe it or not, being quiet at the table. <laughs> I'm not always so loquacious, <laughs> only when I have to be. But, um, and Maureen Dowd came up to the table and was like, I love that show. I never missed an episode of that show. And then John Logan said something to me the other night about it. So artists who I really admire and revere were, uh, enjoyed the show. So I'm glad that it's, you know, slowly but surely yeah. kind of making the rounds. You can stream it. It's so beautiful. Just the look of the show, the feel of the show, the acting is really yeah. tremendous in that. Yeah, and I, was, I also loved... Uh, I, without romanticizing it and also seeing kind of the, the, the dirtier, shadowier part of it that still exists on some level, uh, that studio era of Hollywood and, and the politics of the time and yeah. what went into casting people and keeping a studio running. And I thought the sh series had so many more things to say, especially with the Me Too movement coming yeah, up sure. about how all these things began and why. Um, and I know that they were also planning to deal a lot with race in future seasons. So. Um, it's a pity that it got cut short, but we had a blast when we did it, yeah. You know, I had two of your Boys in the Band co-stars here who did this oh. series for me. Oh. Andrew Reynolds was here and Jim Parsons was here. Oh. And Jim had talked about saying the most <clears throat> amazing experience he ever had in his entire career was doing The Normal Heart. Mm. That was his. But on stage or on film? Both. Wow. Yeah, he said that was the best experience he ever had. Mm. Andrew said that people don't realize is that in between all these big jobs that these star actors have, there's all this downtime and self-doubt and not getting jobs and everything else. And I was wondering, was there ever a time during your career on the way up 
that you had self-doubts of being an actor or oh, yeah. where you could become successful. And how did you get through that? I didn't want I didn't necessarily want to become successful. I yeah. wanted to do work that affected people, even if it just gave them a sense of escapism. Yeah. And there was a time when I'd done a couple series and they didn't really catch on. And it was sort of before White Collar and yeah. Chuck. And I, I think I'd tested for, you know, five or seven pilots and didn't get them. I was just the guy they brought in the room and didn't get the job. Yeah. Um, and it was really debilitating. And I remember the last one I tested for before White Collar, um, the casting director's cell phone went off right in the middle of the network test. And I don't know if you've ever done a network test, but it's, ba it's almost like being here and you go up on a stage like this. It's a little bit smaller of a theater, but it's all suits. It's all executives and bureaucracy, especially at big networks, and they're just watching you do this audition scene. And I was in the middle of a monologue, and this, her phone went off, and she just kept letting it ring. And I thought, do I stop and take charge of this audition and let them know that I am an artist who will not be denied? <laughs> or do I show them that I'm a team player, and when I'm on set, if a phone goes off, I'm not going to blow a take? And I chose the latter, which may not have been the smarter option. Um, and I didn't get the job. And I just thought, oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? And um, so I actually applied to some, some graduate schools for some other things at the time and had sent in an application. And that's when the script for White Collar came my way. Wow. Yeah. What a great story. Thank you for yeah. that. That's yeah. really great. <laughs> Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart graciously kicked off this series wow. for me. Wow. And something we talked about, we talked big about- Big shoes to fill. Yeah, big <laughs> shoes. We talked about acting, and they always felt they were hiding behind something, their mm. true selves. Patrick's whole thing was, you know, Patrick always had a comb over, and he was at a dinner party, mm. and his best friends held him in the dining room chair and shaved his head. Oh! They said, we're shaving your head, and he said that was the most enlightening moment he had that freed him. He always felt he was hiding behind something wow. as an actor in his true self. Ian said that when he came out mm. as a gay actor, he said it freed everything for him. In his acting and also as the type of human being he wanted to be and the type of work he wanted to do. Mm. And I was wondering, when you came out, did it free you in any way of how you wanted to live your life and how you saw yourself as a performer or the types of things you wanted to do as an actor? Um. I think initially it probably had the, the, the reverse effect because I was in the middle of uh, starring as a very heterosexual con man on a successful TV series and I had a show about straight male strippers coming out. And I thought, oh wow, how is this gonna go? Do I need to you know, double down on the butch department? Like what is this gonna be? And, uh, and then I just realized that I knew the characters and I knew yeah. you know, how I was playing them. And I, I think over time it's certainly uh, loosened things up a bit. Um, but I, I think as an actor, I, I was never you know, in the closet with people I worked yeah. with or anything. Yeah. So I was always kind of drawing from myself um, whatever the role required. And so it didn't change a lot of that for me, I have to be honest with you. Um, uh, but I do think when I got the opportunity to finally get a chance to play gay roles, yeah. which is are strangely few and far between for me still, um, I was able to access it on a deeper, more um, unfiltered level. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. What was your most challenging role and why? Hmm. Oh gosh. Well, they're they're all challenging in different ways, you know. I think I would say probably overall uh, Felix in the Normal Heart, only because there was so much emotional breadth to cover and also so much physical breadth to cover, and just losing all that weight and having to be starving to do the second half of it, and and to 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 live in the mindset of somebody because I basically sequestered myself off from my family for the entire second half of the movie and was just living in an apartment by myself in New York and to live with that understanding of what it, that kind of diagnosis meant at that time um, and, and try to bring that to work and, and more profoundly a sense of trying to survive and find grace and spirituality in the midst of that I think was the most rewarding thing about it but I, I would say that was probably also the most challenging thing. Yeah. 
Another question, were there times any unscripted occurrences made a project better than the scripted final draft that you were given? Countless. Yeah. Countless. <laughs> we improvised all the time on White Collar. And, and it's a testament to the creators and the executives on it that they let us, you know, because some people are, are um, no, that's a contraction there. It's not will not, it's won't. You know, so, it, it, you know, it just depends on who you get to work with, what kind of freedoms, what the parameters are. But, uh, yeah, I love improv. Yeah. I love improvisation. I, and I love it in rehearsals. Even if you don't use it in the final product, it can open things up in the scene that make it accessible in a way to you that wouldn't have otherwise. Um, what is more challenging for you as an actor, to prepare <clears throat> for a role that is completely opposite of who you are or one you're closer to? Mm. Oh, gosh. Well, it's all you. Yeah. <laughs> That's what people, you can't wear a mask on a camera. You can change your physicality. You can change the timbre of your voice. You can change how you relate to other people in the world around you. But it's all you. It's all part of you, and it's all part of your imagination. So um, if you're talking about whether or not I have to access different parts of my imagination that I wouldn't have to access if it's someone close to me, then obviously that's, that's I would say, I don't know if challenging is the right word for because I think that's ultimately more rewarding to get to do. Um, but uh, it, it's all you. And that's, that's something I didn't understand when I got out of theater school. And there was an amazing woman who was part of um, the group theater who taught, uh, and, and the actor's uh, studio who taught me in LA. Her name was Penny Allen. She, she played, um, Oh, what's Hamlet's mother's name again? Gertrude, Gertrude yeah. thank you. And the, and the production with Peter Sarsgaard here yeah. a few years ago. Uh, I think that was the last gig she had here in New York. But she told me early on, she was like, it's you. It's just you. You're not hiding behind someone else in the camera. It's you. So find that in you. Uh, and I think that was really scary to me. I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> I can have a limp and a, and you, you know, it's just you. It's just you and the camera sees, so you have to find whatever that role is asking of you in your own imagination and your own creative self. Do you prep for a role the same way on stage <clears throat> as you do on film or on television? <clears throat> Emotionally, um, character-wise, yes. I think there are technical aspects that go into uh, performing on stage that you don't need on film. Um, because I can have a conversation with you like this, whereas if I'm in a house of a thousand people and it's all carpeted like our beautiful Halston Hell set is on that, you know, you have yeah. to speak really loudly. So I do Alexander, I do a vocal warm up every, you know, things that I don't have to do. I still do Alexander on film, but um, just, they're just technical aspects of, of learning, speaking clearly and enunciating properly. And, all the things you need to do for the audience to really understand the story you're trying to tell. Yeah. My final question is, what is the best bit of advice that you've been <clears> given, <throat> either personally or professionally, that you live by? Oh, dear. Hmm. It's the best piece of advice I've been given, either personally or professionally. Well, it's changed yeah. as my career has changed. Like, I think the fact that Jody told me to take any job that came my way was really great advice. It was really good counsel. Not that I had a choice at the time, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think it's the fact that uh, Milton Katselis, who ran the Beverly Hills Playhouse for years, and he had directed some stage work here and some films. It's the fact that there's acting is, is talent and commitment and dedication, but there is also an, an administrative aspect to it. And I had always been such a creative you know, in outer space soul, and, and you have to understand that this is a business as well, if you, wanna, if you want it to be. You know, I, if you can afford to just kind of float around and see where that takes you, God, I'm so jealous of you and good for you. <laughs> but you know, you have a group of people who are working with you who, who in all likelihood have 20 to 50 other people they're working with, and you have to figure out how to be administrative about who you are, where you belong in the business, what opportunities you need and deserve and should be getting, and how to keep them all accountable and, and working for you. And so 
and working for yourself and knowing where you fit into the business. Um, I think that's a tough thing to have to face for a creative person, but I think, I think it's part of ourselves as artists that we have to embrace in order to, to find our niche in the business. Thank you for that. You know, this has been a dream of mine to sit with you here in this chair. I thank you so much <laughs> for you. taking out the time. Thank if you, you haven't thank seen you him, so much. you need to see him in the boys in the band. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Bomer. Thank you so much. Thank you.